cloud. All right. So meeting is being recorded. I just hit admit all. All right. Good morning, guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, we will start here in a couple of minutes, but um, we appreciate you being here this Saturday morning. Um, you should see a join code on your screen. If you will please go to pairdeckjoinpd.com and enter that code while we wait for others to join. That would be great. Dr. G, you can see the um, chat stuff, the chat feature and stuff. Yep. Cool. Man, it's nice to see the sun out. Yeah, well, the sun is Oh, yeah, but you're not, <laughs> not in rainy Seattle. Uh, golly. Uh, so basically, I mean, Seattle's like Bama in February all uh, year. So, so, yeah, know that. And so that's why I'm saying, like, with your bright personality, you couldn't. <laughs> uh -uh, I don't do well with the rain. <laughs> this wouldn't be for you. No. This is definitely not for me. And the turbulence coming out here was something different too now. Yeah, yeah. So you get your kids' passes for a year? All right, so the, we, we went on this random weekend trip and they gave it to us for three months. Like, we didn't even know we had it. So it's good wow. until March. But we have gone so much that, yeah, they'll be free probably around June again. And they'll get the rest of this year and all of next year. Wow. I know. All right. Yes. Um, welcome, everybody. If you are joining, this is um, AP Psych. We will be doing motivation and emotion shortly. If you will um, turn off your cameras, unless you're a teacher, teachers that are joining us will keep their cameras on, and you will go to joinpd.com and put in this join code you see. Hey, Drew, I see you. Morning. You can turn off your video camera and just participate with the Pear Deck. All right. All right, looks like we got about 16 on the Zoom and about That's six in the pair. Yep. So we'll wait a few more minutes. I can imagine on this pretty Saturday morning, it won't, after so many days of rain, we probably won't get a whole lot of people. That's okay. Yeah. The ones that are here are going to be scholars. <laughs> All right, about one more minute, and then we will get started. About 16 in the, in the Zoom room and 10 on Pear Deck. So those of you that, are, that have joined us, you go to joinpd.com and type in this join code. And that should get you connected to the Pear Deck, and that's where all the magic happens. You'll be strengthening those neural circuits as we go through motivation and emotion. Got to give a shout out to Dr. G. He's all the way on the West Coast in Seattle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a rough night. Like, you got here. Then we got into our hotel around uh, 1 30 um, Seattle time. So that's, you know, 3 30 back home. And uh, yeah, so here we are here for the big show. Yeah, yeah. So he's joining us from the West Coast. 
because he loves AP Psych that much. That much. Yep. All right, 19 participants in the Zoom room, 11 in the Pear Deck. When we get to 15 students, I'm taking off. So joinpd.com. Teachers, if we have any teachers that have joined us today, you'll keep your camera on. Students, you'll keep your camera off. Everyone should be muted. If you have any questions, you can shoot them into the chat box and Dr. G will take care of that. And uh, we are tackling motivation and emotion today, which I don't know about you, Dr. G, but my students, this is one of our least favorite units. Yeah, it was always mine, yeah. Yeah. You know, mine always wanted to do disorders, and that's all they ever wanted to do. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't want to do anything else. It's what you sign up for psych for. Right, absolutely. That's all there is in psych. That and child development. Yeah. All right, one more. We need one more, and we're ready to rock. So we got 14 students in Pear Deck. Need one more. All right, there we go. All right, guys, if you continue to, if you're continuing to try to get in, you will be able to get in. The join code will be in the top right box of your screen. Um, okay, so as I said, this is the third study session. It's theories of emotion and mind. And my name is Mrs. Bakken, and we are joined by Dr. G on the West Coast. Um, and uh, he will be manning the chat box. So if you have any questions at any point, feel free to put them in there for him. And then at the end of the session, um, if you have anything left you want to kind of ask, you can stick around. While I'm talking about the end of session, there will also be an opportunity for you to give us feedback. There'll be a Google form link. You'll, you'll type that in. It'll be in the chat box. You'll click on it and then you can fill out the Google form. So stick around for that. And um, because of your attendance today, you're, you'll get a takeaway um, and your teacher will know that you've attended. So yay, y'all. All right. So here we are with um, which statement best describes you at this moment? I'm very confident about describing theories of motivation and emotion. Um, I'm somewhat confident. I'm not yet confident or we haven't covered it in class. If you'll give me some feedback here, that'll kind of help me know how slow to go on some things, how fast to go on th some things. Looks like everybody's covered it. Up, oh, yep, around couple. that somewhat confident, very confident thing. We have a couple that said they haven't finished, so or haven't covered, so that's okay. That is good to know. All right. So today's lesson, we will identify and describe the needs, drives, and incentives. We will explain the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. We will compare and contrast the various theories of motivation and emotion. We will identify contributions of key researchers in the field of motivation and emotion, and we will discuss the biological and physiological components of emotion all in an hour and 15 minutes on this beautiful Saturday morning. So, oh, and by the way, you will be writing an FRQ, which is one of the most important skills that you can practice um, before the AP exam. So thank you guys again for joining us. All right, motivation. So take a couple of minutes and just kind of think about what motivates you um, or motivates someone to drink a gallon of water, cheat on a test, bungee jump, or to run an ultra marathon in the desert? Like, obviously, kind of why you drink a gallon of water is kind of easy, but why in the world would somebody, you know, risk their life by jumping off a cliff with a rubber band attached to their ankles? Or run a uh, hundred mile marathon in a desert like that does not seem to be naturally something we'd want to do so take a few seconds think through these different scenarios and and you know type out a few things if you want um take a moment to notice is it the same motivation for each of these behaviors is it something different You guys are really thought, thoughtful students. I see puffing an alligator <laughs> working away, zebra. I like the animal thing today. Um, one thing to kind of keep in mind is that human behavior is very complex. And so as you can see by these four activities here, um, they're different theories for why we do different things. And that's why in this unit, there's a lot of theories um, for what motivates us because our behaviors are very complex. 
All right, we're going to move on because we've got your brain thinking. As we discuss aspects of motivation, try to think of times in your life when you've been motivated in these ways. It's that self-referencing principle that your teacher probably talked to you about in the cognition unit. The more you can attach personal experiences to what you're learning, the easier time you'll have making connections in those neural circuits um, and the easier time you'll have on the test. So when you can think of personal experiences, try to apply those to what you're learning this morning. All right, so this question, question one, theories of motivation that assert the existence of biological motives to maintain the body in a steady state are called what? All right, we've got a bunch of questions to get through today. So I'm gonna move rather quickly to give you an opportunity to stick with it and uh, not get too bogged down, but it looks like you guys are right on track with this one. Um, for most of you, you have answered homeostatic and that is correct. Um, remember, I saw a couple of people uh, mark instinctual. Instinctive behaviors are uh, species wide, uh, general, and they are unlearned. And so we talk about instincts a lot when we talk about animal behavior, human behavior is much more complex. And so we don't have a ton of, of instinctual behaviors. Um, but in this case, the answer is homeostatic. And remember, um, homeostasis is the tendency for bodily functions to maintain equilibrium. Most of you got that one. All right, so just a little few back to basics. So as I said a second ago, instincts are inborn, they're unlearned, they're species wide. Um, and so animals have more instinctual behaviors than humans. Um, a drive is a physiological need that creates an aroused tension state. Um, and so the, the need can be food, water. The drive is the hunger and the thirst. A primary drive is something that is needed to survive. It's innate, so hunger, thirst. A secondary drive is learned. So stickers in your kindergarten class, um, you know, a, 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 until a kindergartner learns that that sticker will get them a little trinket or toy, or that sticker will get their praise from the teacher, the sticker doesn't mean much. So that's a learned secondary. Um, actually, that's a secondary incentive. An incentive is a positive or negative environmental stimulus that motivates behavior. So drives push, incentives pull behavior. And then we've already kind of defined homeostasis. Um, one thing to note, and I'm going to kind of read this because I think it's a good reminder. Um, these terms are often used interchangeably, but they aren't necessarily the same thing. For instance, receiving a reward for a certain behavior can create an incentive to perform the behavior, but only if it's known that the reward will follow the behavior. So an incentive, a reward becomes an incentive when the person knows that they will get the reward and thus they behave that way. A reward can also re serve as a reinforcer, which you learned in the learning unit, but only if receiving the reward increases the chance the behavior occurs again. For example, your teacher may offer you the reward of bonus points on a test for attending the study session, but if you have a really good grade, that may not be an effective incentive and you won't be motivated to come to the session. Likewise, if you do receive bonus points, the reward, but your grade doesn't really change, you may not come to the next study session, making the reward not a very good reinforcer because it didn't encourage the behavior. So these, I mean, my students oftentimes interchange these words in casual conversation because they can be interchangeable, but only in certain circumstances and context. So my advice to you guys, when you take that AP exam, be very strict with your definition and use the one that you learned in class to make sure that you're, you're using it in the correct context. Reinforcers increase behavior, rewards um, can incentivize, incentivize behavior, but only if you know that you're going to receive the reward and therefore do the behavior. All right, so question two, what is the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation? You can see on kind of the, 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 the slide here, some differences in extrinsic and intrinsic motivators. Extrinsic is external, intrinsic is internal. Savannah is a junior in high school and is preparing for an exam in her beginning Japanese course. The exam will consist of both written and spoken portions. 
describe how intrinsic motivation relates to Savannah's successful learning and performance. Give you a few minutes to look through those. Good morning, Ms. McNeely, good to see you. Hope your school year is going well. Here, let's see if I can share this answer. Yeah, maybe not. Here is an excellent answer to this question. Uh, she enjoys Japanese and finds the language fascinating, so she desires to learn it for personal growth. Excellent, and it, it demonstrates your understanding of intrinsic motivator and it applies it appropriately to Sarah learning Japanese. Good job. Um, so you can see here kind of the answer. Um, Savannah, or, or a couple of other options. Savannah chose the Japanese class because she thought it would be interesting and fun. Therefore, she is internally pushed to study and would put forth the time because she is genuinely interested in learning the language. And this focus and time studying will help her perform well in test. In the possible answers here, the yellow highlighted part is applying the definition or, or kind of explaining the definition and the blue part is applying it to the prompt. This is the kind of way you wanna formulate your FRQ answers. Some teachers say uh, uh, define and apply, but as you guys know, the definition alone won't score, you need the application. But by putting some of the definition in there, the reader will say, oh, this, this kid knows exactly what they're talking about. So a little bonus question, in what way might paying Savannah to study for the test actually hinder her performance on the, on the, um, in the class. And in this case, we're talking about the uh, overjustification effect, um, which is a phenomenon in which being rewarded for doing something actually diminishes intrinsic motivation to perform the action. So if Savannah starts, if her parents start giving, paying her for getting good grades, what can actually happen is that either if the payment stops She's then disappointed and no longer uh, associates the intrinsic motivation, the pride of learning Japanese with her performance. And so it diminishes or the individual shifts the focus of the behavior to receiving the extrinsic motivator. So when the motivator is no longer present, there is a perception of insufficiency or more attention. She pays more attention to the extrinsic motivator being paid to, to pass the test and diminishes her attention to the intrinsic reward, making the behavior less intrinsically rewarding. All right, question three. I told you we're gonna be quite popping you with questions all day. Carla tutors other students because she likes to be helpful, whereas Jane tutors classmates strictly for pay. Their behaviors demonstrate the difference between... Nice, nice. I think you guys are getting it. Very good. Most of you have recognized it is intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. All right, this one, you're gonna do a little matching. So draw, you can draw anywhere on this slide, but what I'd like you to do is to draw a line to match the theory with its description. This is a tougher one. It's gonna you know, test your review of the different theories. We'll go through each of them in a second.
nice. <clears throat> Looks like you guys are getting this one too for the most part. So here kind of the answers. So the drive reduction theory, this is the one that focuses on your biological, physiological needs. So if you see any question that talks about hunger, thirst, body temperature, your physiological needs, and you're doing a behavior to reduce those needs, that's drive reduction theory. Arousal theory, as the kind of answer says here, this is where you're avoiding boredom or trying to maintain optimal arousal. Classic bungee jumpers. Why in the world would a human um, challenge or, or go against their instinct for survival by jumping off of a cliff? It's not to do anything to survive. They're not, they're not satisfying a need, a biological need, but rather they're looking for that um, excitement, that optimal arousal. Evolution theory, as it says here, this is really based on the work of Darwin, and it's real, it really leans heavily into instincts. But um, as your book, many of the textbooks kind of mention, this one's not used as often now because we are such complex creatures. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I saw most of you got this one right off the bat. You are doing behaviors to satisfy these needs that are, that are divided into five categories, and you're moving up the pyramid. Incentive theory, you're motivated by rewards or avoiding punishments. And then the cognitive dissonance theory, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the other side. So here's some kind of just picture reviews to kind of go back through really quickly. Remember, drive reduction, you're, in, you're in maintaining homeostasis. There is something that it creates an unbalanced homeostasis. And so you fulfill, there's a drive to fulfill the need or satisfy the need, and then you maintain homeostasis again. Incentive theory, you're being pulled to do a certain behavior by a reward or to avoid a punishment. Arousal theory, as we talked about, you're avoiding boredom, you're seeking that, um, that peak stimulation. But this is a good time to talk about the Yerkes Dodson Law. Make sure that you recognize this. And you guys have probably all experienced this in some form or fashion in your life. If you're a musician and you're working on a difficult piece of music and you're thrown into a recital and you're not quite ready, that, that anxiety, that stress is going to maybe cause you to trip up on your piece of music. Um, whereas when you practiced it at home in front of your family, it was a little nerve wracking, but it wasn't overly nerve wracking. And so you played it beautifully. Um, another kind of example. And so that you've had this moderate level of stress, your family watching you, you played it beautifully, you hit peak performance, you get thrown into a recital and the school watches you and you're not ready, you're going to become overly stressed and it's going to lower your, your performance. Another good example of this is if those of you that love to procrastinate, you work on a paper that's assigned two weeks in advance, you just can't quite hammer it out. Those juices aren't flowing. You can't get the thesis statement of what you want to say in the paper. Um, but then somehow miraculously, two days before, you start really getting a good idea of what you want to write and you hammer out that paper quickly. On the other hand, you forget you have a paper due and it's due in six hours and you get up early before school and you're just so stressed. You can't even figure out what you want to write and you feel like you can't put anything on paper. You've, you've had too much stress and it's going to reduce your performance. So this is called the yerkes dodson Law. And I would definitely make sure that you can read this graph and understand it and apply it to a scenario. All right, another kind of thing you wanna know when we're studying these different types of motivation theories is Kurt Lewin's motivational conflict, uh, conflict theory. And in this case, you kind of have three different things. The first is the approach approach. You have a decision that has two good options. Do you want a taco or a hamburger? Do you wanna to go to the beach or Atlanta? You know, two, for you, this might be two good options and this still causes stress. Um, there's still a decision having to be made between two good options, and that can be stressful. The, the avoidance, avoidance, look at the bottom of the slide. This is where you have a decision to be made, but they're two bad options. And so you can either get the flu shot, which is not fun to have a shot, or you could get the flu. That's not fun. Um, or you, uh, your parents tell you to you clean your room or rake leaves. Neither one of those are appealing. The last option is the one in the middle, and this is the approach avoidance. And this is where you have one event that has 
both pro and cons, both good and bad. So you can run errands with your mom, yeah. but while you're out, you can get ice cream. Yay. Um, and so this is where you got a decision that has both good and bad. And this is Kurt Lewin's motivational conflict theory. So here we are to question number four. Drive reduction as a motivational concept is best exemplified by which of the following? Very good. Looks like most of you are getting it. About half of you have responded. Give you a few more minutes. All right. And the answer is C, the injection of heroin by an addict to avoid withdrawal symptoms. Notice in this answer that there is a physiological reaction. The person is experiencing with withdrawal symptoms. So in this case, his homeostasis has become dependent on heroin, the opioid. And so now the drug use has become, using the drugs is to reduce the withdrawal symptoms. If this were somebody that were experimenting with drugs, you might could argue something like incentive or optimal arousal, but because this answer has a physiological response, it is exemplifying the drive reduction theory. All right, draw a line to connect. The uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs with the examples that you see. All right, nice work. Um, the first one is goes with, let me go to over here. The first one is with safety. The second one is with um, esteem. The third one, Alejandro was invited to play with his new friend is love and belonging. The fourth one, me eating with granola bar is physiological. And the fifth one, Billy feeling pride for sticking with AP psychology is self-actualization. Nice job, you guys. Looks like you've got a pretty good handle on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So question five, Georgie believes she is capable of playing extremely well in the volleyball game scheduled for tonight. Albert Bandura, Albert Bandura would most likely say that Georgie's expectations for this task reveal that she is exhibiting high what? Hey, this one's a little more challenging. This is not uncommon. Many of you are getting self-esteem and self-efficacy confused. So let's take a few moments to go over this one. So the answer in this um, for this one is self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is the expectation that personal efforts will lead to success. So self-efficacy is where you feel effective in a task 
and esteem is a sense of self-worth. So for example, um, your self-efficacy is the perception of your ability to reach a goal. Um, whereas your self-esteem is how do you feel your sense of self-worth? If you, as this example says here, if you don't rely on, um, on your math performance to determine your self-worth, you could you know, have a low self-efficacy in math, but it won't affect your self-esteem. So you recognize I'm not the best math student, but I still have great sense of self-worth. Um, and, and that's where you should be. You should not put your self-esteem in the performance of your academics all of the time. Um, and especially in one subject, you know, you can be a great student, you can be a great friend, you can have great self-worth um, and, and yet you're just not a great chemistry student and that's okay. Um, but if you have really high standards for yourself, you might have self-efficacy for a math performance, but see, be so hard on yourself that you have low self-esteem. So these two things can be close, but they are not in interchangeable. They are not the same thing. So when you see self-efficacy, think about how effective you are in a task. And when you see self-esteem, that's your sense of self-worth. All right, question six. According to the cognitive dissonance theory, human beings are motivated to... And I know for my students, we actually haven't covered this yet. I don't think somehow we missed it, but we'll come back to it. See about 17 responses so far. Waiting for those last few students. All right, so the answer to this question is D. This is a bit of a challenging one. So according to the cognitive dissonance theory, human beings are motivated to reduce tension produced by inconsistent thoughts. So here's kind of how the cognitive dissonance theory works. You have a belief, something like smoking is bad for you, you will cause cancer, and you have an action you have started to smoke and you are addicted to smoking. The belief, the recognition that smoking is bad for you and the action you are smoking will create tension. It will create discomfort because you know what you're doing is unhealthy and yet you still do it. And this, the term for this discomfort is dissonance. And so cognitive dissonance means there's discomfort or tension in your, in your brain, in your thinking. And so what will happen if you experience this cognitive dissonance is one of a couple of things. You will either change your action, you'll quit, you'll be motivated to quit smoking so that now your action, not smoking, lines up with your thinking. You'll change your belief. Well, it's not really all cigarettes that cause cancer. It's just unfiltered. Or it's not really, you know, not everybody will get cancer from smoking. So it must be um, a genetic trait or something. You'll change your belief to be able to reduce the tension and continue smoking, or you'll change your perception. And with the change, then you, you no longer have that dissonance. It becomes more, um, you lose that tension. That tension is eased. And so this is the theory of cognitive dissonance. And this is a theory of motivation because it explains why some people act or change their behavior um, because of the cognitive discomfort they're feeling, or they'll change their thinking. All right, so that kind of finishes up our emotion section. Let, I mean, our emo motivation section. Let's move on to emotion. All right, what is the difference between these two eyes? What are these eyes communicating? We are able to tell that the eyes on the left are possibly those of an excited, scared, or surprised person, and the ones on the right are those of a calm, depressed, or bored person. Why might this be significant? Why, might, why is it that we can recognize this fairly quickly with no other um, information um, for us to, to use? 
And one of one answer is it gives us a very quick ability to judge a threat. Emotions are a response for the whole organism. It involves physiological arousal, expressive behaviors, and conscious experience. How do these three pieces fit together? That's what this part of the unit is really about. How do physiological arousal, cognitive experiences, and expressive behaviors, how do they fit together to create this emotional experience? How do you think and how do you, how does thinking and feeling interact? Which comes first, your body feeling fear and then experiencing fear, feeling your heart race, and then recognizing it's fear and then feeling the emotion of fear. How do these three pieces fall in line? And they're different theories. We're not asking you to judge which one is best or correct. We're just rec asking you to recognize the different theories. So question seven, Lee is about to skydive for the first time. He, inter he interprets his racing heart to be a result of his eager anticipation and excitement. This best represents which theory of emotion? And I can give you a clue for those of you that might be kind of hesitant and unsure. There is a key word in this question. It says he interprets his racing heart. So if you're interpreting something, there's a cognition taking place. And then he feels the, and he recognizes this, recognizes this as anticipation and excitement. So there's the physiological plus the cognition. And this is the Schachter two-factor theory. Um, so I, you know, really kind of tell my kids with this one, think of like a math equation. You've got the physiological plus the cognitive equals the emotion, two factors, factor analysis, factor, um, factor, factorials in math. Um, and so that's kind of my mnemonic for this one. This is the only one of the big three that involves cognition. And so in this case, that keyword of interpret, he had the physiological he thought about it, he interpreted it, and then he experienced the anticipation and excitement. All right, so we kind of, so that factors, two factors there on the far right. Um, to experience emotion, one must be physically aroused and cognitively label the experience and before they realize or, or experience the emotion. The other two are the James Lane and the Cannon Bard. So the James Lane one uh, theory is that our experience of emotion is our awareness of our physiological responses to emotion arousing stimuli. And so with James Lang, arousal comes before emotion, A before E in the alphabet, J before L in the alphabet. You have the physiological arousal, the heart race, the heart racing, you begin to sweat, your pupils dilate, and then you experience the emotion. So we are happy because we smile. The smile, the physiological response of smiling or the action of smiling creates the happiness. Cannon and Bard came along and they said, wait a second. If we look at people's physiological responses to fear and excitement and love, they look very similar. In all three of those experiences, your heart races, your, your pupils dilate, you begin to perspirate and your respiration increases. So you're, you're, you can't differentiate because of, the, because of those physiological experiences. You can't determine a different emotional experience just because of physiologically what you're experiencing. And so what they said was that they happen at the same time, um, that an emotion arousing stimulus simultaneously triggers both the physiological arousal and the emotion. C and B come together in the alphabet, emotion and arousal come together simultaneously. And so that's the difference between these three. And like I said, you won't be asked to judge which one works because frankly, they all probably have a place in a time. You probably can think of a time where when you started smiling because somebody says, hey, perk up, smile, it's a beautiful day outside. You, you started to feel better 
Or you can see in the picture of the James Lang box on the far left, he ran experiments where he had people hold pencils in their teeth. And by manufacturing that smile, by having the facial muscles contract and pull up, it actually increased their sense of happiness. On the other hand, if you put the pencil under your nose and frown, it actually enhanced their experience of, of, of frustration. And so there probably were times that you kind of faked it till you made it. Um, you smiled until you felt better. Um, and then there are other times where you probably can't really decide yet if you're anxious or excited because you kind of feel the same thing and you're not really sure because it's happening simultaneously. All right, so take a second to look over this and drag the icon to the letter that corresponds to each theory one at a time. This is an interesting one to uh, assess, Dr. D, don't you think? <laughs> I can't really tell what's going on from the teacher dashboard. <laughs> but they're working through it. That's what yeah, matters. There's dots everywhere. and <laughs> They're no, all no, blue. Not yet. Yeah, no, no change there, right? No change in color or whatever. So, But the point is, y'all are thinking through this question, and that's important. Okay, so what you should have found is that A, the far left one, is the James Lang theory. The pounding heart, the arousal, A, comes before emotion, the fear. The one in the middle is the cannon barred one. The pounding heart and the emotion happen simultaneously. And then the one on the far right is the two-factor theory. The pounding heart, the recognition, I am afraid, is creating the emotional experience of fear. All right, question eight. Which of the following best supports the hypothesis that basic human emotions, such as sadness, are innate? Innate meaning unlearned. Innate means that we were born with them, with an understanding. Got half the responses in, give you a few more minutes because we've reached the point. We are good on time, but I wanna give you plenty of time to write your FRQs. All right, yeah. looks like yeah, you're- the top breakers. Yep, yep. So the answer is C. Let's walk through this because several of you were guessing A and E. Um, so let's kind of go through this. A and E um, do refer to innate, innate aspects of human emotion. But as mentioned, physiological responses like blood pressure increase is associated with many different emotions. And crying is more related to trying to reduce the drive and motivation. This is the biological psychology answer, not the evolutionary psychology answer. What do all humans have in common? B references the developmental aspect of understanding emotions, so it would be more appropriate to support a developmental psychology hypothesis. D refers to emotional intelligence, which would answer a cognitive psychology hypothesis. Only C gives evidence that could support the evolutionary psychology hypothesis. Basic emotions are understood and express, expressed in a similar fashion by individuals from diverse cultures. What this question is referring to is Paul Ekman's study of universal emotions. Um, so you can see here kind of um, the different universal emotions. The hypothesis is that Ekman thought facial expressions are socially learned, so there should be cultural variations in interpreting emotions and faces. The method he used for studying this was that participants were from a remote area of New Guinea 
um, to control for learned expressions. They photographed making different ex facial expressions. And the results is that people across cultures largely agreed on the meaning of the photographed faces. So can you interpret what this slide is kind of uh, saying? And then the question is what should be concluded from this study? I'll give you a few seconds to answer this. Okay, I wanna make sure that I've given you plenty of time to write your FRQ. And so we are going to kind of move on, but something that you could have written is something like this. Um, the conclusion, Ekman's hypothesis is not supported. Recognition of facial expressions of emotion may be universal, therefore inherited, therefore biological in nature. Um, actually what Ekman found was that when he went to New Guinea and he took photographs of Westerners that were, were smiling or frowning or looking at faces of disgust, anger, surprise, et cetera, that um, through a translator, he recognized that the people in New Guinea recognized these emotions as disgust, anger, surprise, et cetera. And then when he asked them to make faces of anger, disgust, surprise, et cetera, they in turn made similar face, faces or the same faces that Westerners made. And so he concluded that there was a universal basic emotion that all cultures both expressed and experienced and recognized. All right, now for the free response practice. So a couple of quick reminders, um, as you can see kind of underlined here, don't stress too much about spelling but spelling does need to be close enough that we can make out what the word is with confidence. Um, to that note, also handwriting, please y'all write legibly. We work really hard to make sure that we can read it, but every now and then there's just somebody that we can't read. Um, and if we can't read it, we can't score it. So please make sure you write clearly. Um, the point is earned when you clearly convey which part of the question that you are answering. We like for you to go in order so that there's no question. But if you go out of order, you need to make sure that you are clear in your answer to which part you're answering. I've watched people not earn points before because they go out of order and we think they're probably answering something earlier in the question or they, are, they write an answer that is correct for something earlier in the prompt, but they don't clarify that. And the table leader will say it doesn't score. So make sure that you are clearly conveying which part of the question you're answering. And if you can go in order, that's better. If you need to skip a space and come back to that point, skip the space and come back. Um, but if it, it just make sure that you're clearly conveying which part of the question you're answering. Um, as always, we talk about this a lot. Definition alone does not score. Defining a word helps. If it's questionable, if it's borderline, and we're not sure if you know what you're talking about, the application is weak, it's kind of gray. If you have a definition, we'll give you the point. Um, and if you don't have the definition and your application is solid, you score the point. Application scores the point. So make sure you apply the, the answer to the prompt. Um, and again, the, the point is not earned if you use a definition alone or if you have contradictory information. Um, you can write an incorrect fact, you just can't co contradict the point that we're assessing you on. And then lastly, um, as you said, addresses, uh, 
if the response within the bulleted question part, if the response addresses details from a scenario other than the one at the prompt, the point is not earned. All right, so you're gonna get quite a bit of time to write this. Explain how each of the following plays a role in eating behavior. Drive reduction theory, external cues, observational learning, time and is important variable and a psychological concept. Describe a specific example that clearly demonstrates an understanding of each of the following concepts and how it relates to or is affected by time. Use a different example for each concept. And you can see the concepts there. All right, I will be quiet and let you write.
All right, trying to give you some feedback as we go along. I'm gonna give you a couple more minutes and then we'll go through the rubric together. All right, let's go through this rubric together because that's the I think that's the best time when you can kind of see what the what the readers are looking for and requiring. All right, so drive reduction theory. Most of you did a good job with this. Shouldn't have any point. I mean, any problems. Um, notice how if you haven't seen one of these rubrics before, there are very specific things that the College Board tells the readers that we have to look for and that we can score or we cannot score. And so sometimes that is, um, that's tough as a reader because I, you know, I want to give a student some points because I feel like they're on the right track. But if they don't have what their College Board is looking for, then I can't give them the point. Or sometimes if, if it's a good answer, but there's one thing that's wrong and the College Board says, do not score this, then that, that's something we have to consider and we can't score it. So with the drive reduction theory, responses should explain that a physiological need creates a, a psychological drive of hunger that affects eating behavior. So the need is the food and the drive is the hunger. Um, and so you could have included things like a drop in blood glucose, stomach contractions, being out of homeostasis, or other physiological responses as descriptions of physiological need for food, which by the way, I told somebody in their answer that I didn't think they were specific enough, but that they did mention homeostasis. My table reader would have said, oh yeah, look, in the rubric, it says being out of homeostasis. So to whoever I gave you that comment, good job, you got the point. Um, and you could say something like motivated to eat as satisfying both the drive and the eating behavior requirement. Um, but you cannot score just drive or driven alone. Um, responses may describe that a lack of physiological, a psychological need creating a psychological drive. Sorry, let me, re let me restate that. Responses may describe that a lack of physiological need creating a lack of psychological drive of hunger reduces eating behavior. So in other words, I'm not eating because I'm not hungry, because I ate an hour ago and my body is in homeostasis. All right, point number two, we had not gone over this in our session and many of you did great with this. And that's good because you will see something on the AP exam that is not um, something you've covered in class. So do not panic, you're going to be fine. Just keep working, use synonyms and, and try your best. But in this case, notice how it says responses should explain how the presence of food of a stimulus or a stimulus associated with food as experienced through specific sensory input will affect eating behavior. Being an external cue, it needs to be a specific stimuli outside of your body. So you cannot score, we could not score references to thoughts or internal processes without some specific external sensory experience. So something like, I couldn't say I was hungry because I was thinking about nachos, but rather I could say I smelled somebody's fajitas 
And it made me think about nachos and thus I was hungry. Um, do not score references to circadian rhythm, passage of time. Again, there has to be an external sensory experience. Um, for number three, let's see if I got the up oh, note. For number three, um, with observational learning, this is something you've probably learned already earlier in the year. Responses should explain that if people see a behavior related to eating, then they learn and exhibit the same behavior. And I remember a few years ago with the rubric with observational learning, not only did you have to see the behavior, you had to mimic it. So you see it, you learn it, and then you exhibit it yourself. Okay, fluid intelligence. Um, this is where some of you like, it's a Saturday morning, we're relaxed, we're typing out quick answers. That's, that's fine as long as you're thinking deeper, but don't get in a habit of shortchanging yourself. Don't get in a habit of writing quick, quick to the point answers and not being thorough and precise so that when you get on your chapter test or you get on your unit test, you haven't thought all the way through the process because the college board, they were picky with these answers. So for fluid intelligence, the student had to both include a dynamic cognitive component, which basically that means giving some example of reasoning ability, problem solving, flexibility, processing, et cetera. And you had to establish a time relationship appropriate to fluid intelligence. So you needed to say either the decline of fluid intelligence over time, as you age, you aren't, um, you don't solve puzzles as quickly. Um, or you could say how people with greater influ fluid intelligence require less time to complete a cognitive task, such as problem solving. So you had to have both what type of task included fluid intelligence and the element of time. Um, to get the point. So some examples that they saw when they offered this question to students. Fluid intelligence, the ability to think and solve problems, decreases as one ages. Or people with less fluid intelligence take more time to solve puzzles than people with more fluid intelligence. So both of those components are in those answers. So it doesn't have to be a complex answer. It just has to be complete. And you have to show that you know exactly what fluid intelligence is. Um, the James Lang theory of emotion, the student must demonstrate through description of example that emotional experience is a two-step process whereby a physiological or behavioral response precedes the emotion. The student does not need to specify the original stimulus event. So for example, I'm running from the, sh the mean dog, therefore I'm scared. I'm running, therefore I'm scared. Or I'm screaming, so I'm afraid. I'm crying, comma, I must be sad. So in these cases, you're showing a physiological behavior that comes before the emotional experience. Um, and so things like therefore, then, so, because, um, all work, but not and. I'm, screen, I, I'm running and I'm scared. That would, uh, I don't think that would work as well because that's happening simultaneously. Um, and notice with the, with the trap, do not score the point um, if the student's answer implies that the physiological and emotional responses are happening simultaneously. So that and wouldn't work because and makes it sound like it's happening together. So when you're talking James Lang, use conjunctions like therefore, thus, so, because. Physiological arousal, then the emotional experience. So the refractory period, um, with this answer, student must establish that it takes time before a neuron can ready itself to generate a second action potential. Um, and if a student says, and this is kind of picky, but again, if the rubric has it, we have to follow the rubric. If a student says that the cell is at rest or resting, he or she must differentiate between the rest and the cell's resting potential by noting that during the refractory period, the cell is recharging, recovering, or unable to fire. Um, so you can't just say that it's at rest. You have to state that it's at rest and preparing to fire again. Um, a student may use an, anal an analogy like a neuron is like a camera flash or a neuron is like a toilet, um, that all or nothing aspect um, to establish the notion of recharging. So according to this rubric answer, you can't just say that it's at rest. You have to say that it's at rest because it's preparing to fire again. You have to indicate that all or nothing effect. So typical examples were things like the refractory period is the time it takes for a neuron to repolarize so it can fire again, 
or a refractory period is like the time when a camera flash is recharging so it can be used again. Um, so again, kind of that red box is emphasizing what I have said um, earlier. And then point seven with sound localization. Again, the student must do both. Establish that sound localization requires the input from both ears and indicates that the sound location, localization is possible because the sound waves reach one ear in less time before they reach the other. So something like a sound to your left reaches your ear slightly before it reaches your right ear, allowing us to determine the location of the sound. Or it is difficult to pinpoint sound coming directly in front or behind you because it reaches both ears at the same time. Even though this answer, the rubric has it, you must do both, most students will answer this question correctly because when they learn about sound localization, the understanding of sound localization is that both ears, both ears are being used and sound waves are reaching one before the other. Um, and so um, this, this question is usually answered correctly. But notice that they have a couple of, of do not scores. Do not score the point if the student refers to intensity or distance of a sound without noting the importance of the two ear difference. Do not score the point if the student refers to the two ears without establishing the time differential. The sound waves hit one ear before the other. You guys would do fine with that anyway, probably. All right, so we are wrapping up. We've got six more minutes left. Um, so if you would give me a check mark how you feel now, we have blown through a lot of material in this hour. And you guys have been so great in participating on this Saturday morning. Yay, I am so glad to see that. It looks like everybody has moved up um, the um, chart and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. I'm glad that you found some value and benefit in today. That makes Dr. G and I very happy. All right, so Dr. G, if you'll put that um, form in the chat box, if you can do that. If not, students. <laughs> oh, you know what? I think I, let's see I if I can. I don't know, hang on. Please. Let me. No, I can. Give, give me a sec. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know why my voice is giving out. All right, let's try this. Actually, I think I got it, although I might be showing you some of Boom, my. Boom, there it is. In the chat. Sweet. All right, good deal. Um, if you guys would fill out this form and give us feedback, we would appreciate it. We use this to kind of tailor the next uh, the next sessions, um, time wise, material wise. I know we ran fast today. Um, you guys did a great job of hanging in there. Since you have that in the chat box, once you have filled out that Google form, I think you are good to go, Doctor G. I think um, if you, we can talk afterwards, but I think we need to make sure that we. Um, mark the teachers that were here and let them know. Already done. Awesome. Well, in that case, you guys, with four minutes to spare, three minutes to spare, I hope you guys um, have a wonderful Saturday. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. G, thank you for joining us um, from the Pacific time zone. And um, I hope you all, those of us in Alabama, can get out and enjoy the sunny weather today. Um, and I'm going to go play in the rain. <laughs> But you guys see what Seattle, Seattle has to offer. And right. um, thank you again, guys. You are free to go once you filled out the Google form and hope you have a great rest of your spring semester. Oh, one more thing. Don't forget AP Palooza. Ask your teacher about it if they haven't told you about it because it will be coming up before we know it. All right, you guys, you are free to go. Have a great one. Bye, Jacqueline.
All right, I think it's just us, right? Yep. Okay, let me stop recording.